I'd like to ask if anyone has got a cell phone to put it on stun or silent uh, mode. And um, for those of us who have blackberries, to keep them off the table as they tend to interfere with the AV equipment. Um, committee members w may be accessing their laptops because the materials we're using today are on, on we have on soft copy um, rather than um, necessarily doing their email. This is an official business meeting of the Medical Board of California, and we will um, conduct this um, in a disciplined fashion and will hope to avoid any disruptions. We have a designated time on the agenda for public comment, and we'll ask for public comment on each agenda item. Please be respectful of the need to conduct the board's business, and um, I would ask that for that um, members of the public limit their comments to three minutes each, so that we can get through our agenda. And as I we will, um, as I said, we will have public comment on any item, every item on the agenda. Um, and if I forget somebody, please raise their hand. Kurt, <laughs> my my lawyer here, keeping me honest. Um, and if you and if it, it, it helps us if so, anyone wants to speak to fill out a slip, Lisa will collect the slips, uh, Ms. Toof, um, and um, and if you haven't and would like to speak on an agenda item, just raise your hand and I recognize you. But we'll ask that you fill out a slip after the fact, um, and I will do my best to call on everyone who has who has a desire to speak. Um, Ms. Toof, could you call the roll? Ms. Shipsky. Dr. Diego? Here. Dr. Solensman? Here. Ms. Yaroslavsky? Here. Thank you. Dr. Lowe? And Dr. Levine? Here. Thank you. Um, we, we do have a quorum, and, and so we can proceed. I don't have any slips in hand. Is there anyone who would like to speak on an agenda item, uh, on an item that is not on our agenda for this afternoon? Seeing no hands, I think then we can proceed with the agenda. We will move to item, agenda item number three, which is approval of the minutes from the September 19th, 2012 committee meeting. Can I have a motion to approve the meeting, to approve the minutes? Are there any additions or corrections to the minutes? Any changes that board members have seen? Uh, seeing none, is there a second? Can I get a second? Ms. Salmonson, thank you. Um, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, the minutes are approved. Moving on to item number four, um, uh, our review of some of the 2013 legislation that impacts the practice of medicine and the Medical Board of California. Ms. Samoz is going to walk us through the bills, and she will indicate where we need to actually take a position and where the discussion is for information purposes. Thank you. Um, I just handed out an updated tracker list because where we're at in the process, things are changing every day. So um, on your tracker list, the bills in green we're going to be discussing at this um, committee hearing. And the bills in yellow will be discussed at the full board meeting on April 25th and 26th. And the bills in blue are spot bills. Um, if they are amended by April 22nd with language related to the board, they will also be discussed at the full board meeting. I do want to point out that the board's sunset bill, SB 304, has been introduced. However, it now only includes the extension of the sunset date. So if language gets amended um, before our board meeting, we will also be discussing that one. So let's start with the first bill. AB 154 Atkins is sponsored by Access Women's Health Justice, American Civil Liberties Union of California, Black Women for Wellness California, Latinas for Reproductive Justice, NARAL Pro-Choice California, and Planned Parenthood Affiliates of California. This bill would eliminate the distinction on the existing law between surgical and non-surgical abortions and would allow physician assistants, nurse practitioners, and certified nurse midwives to perform an abortion by medication or aspiration techniques in the first trimester of pregnancy if specified training is completed and clinical competency is validated. This bill would essentially codify the Health Workforce Pilot Project, HWPP number 171, that was coordinated through the Office of Statewide Health Planning and Development and sponsored by the Advancing New Standards and Reproductive Health Program at the University of California, San Francisco. The purpose of the pilot project was to evaluate the safety, effectiveness, and acceptability of NPs, NMs, and PAs in providing aspiration abortions, and to evaluate the implementation of a standardized competency-based curriculum in provision of aspiration abortion care. As part of the pilot, 
40 nurse practitioners, um, certified nurse midwives, and physician assistants were trained to be competent in aspiration abortion care. Clinicians participated in a comprehensive didactic and supervised clinical training program, which included a written exam and competency-based evaluation process. Trainee competency Competency was evaluated daily, and at the end of the training on confidence, procedural performance, patient care, communication, interpersonal skills, professionalism, practice-based learning, and clinical knowledge. This bill would require PAs, NPs, and CNMs to complete specified training and achieve clinical competency, which was also required as a part of the pilot project, before they are allowed to perform abortions by medication or aspiration techniques. The sponsors believe that increasing the number of providers for aspiration abortions will increase the ability of women to receive safe reproductive health care from providers in their community. Staff is suggesting that the committee recommend that the board take a neutral position on this bill, but I would need a motion. Do I hear a second? Um, so let's have let's discuss the bill before we vote on it, Ms. Yaroslavsky. Oh. So I would like to know what why staff uh, feels that a neutral position is versus a support position is appropriate. Um, I think support <coughs> is another way we could go. Um, I just um, was not sure if the the board would be supportive of this measure. The reason I'm asking the question specifically is that this board was well aware of the of the um, pilot project going on, mm -hmm. observed the pilot project numerous occasions. Um, as far as I know, there was no issues as to the appropriateness of the educational opportunities that were afforded, the oversight and uh, supervision by a on-site um, um, appropriate person. I'm trying to remember the title, if it was a... Um, not only the medical director, but also a um, provider of services. So I'm not sure why. I mean, I think we could go either way. I think we could go neutral, and um, but we could be supportive of the measure too. Okay. I just want to point out, not on the merits, just te the technicality with that, that. None. Of, I apologize. This microphone thing. None of these. Uh, none of these licensed groups are in fact de facto. Medical board licensees, correct? Correct. If I may, um, the board usually takes a cautious approach when we look at the expansion of scope of practice, and so staff felt that going uh, with a suggested neutral position, especially because the full board hasn't been able to discuss this and review it in this format, might be the more appropriate way for the executive committee to go, although certainly at the full board meeting, you can uh, discuss the reasons why you would want to support it. Okay. But you certainly can go with a different position. So as I and so what we we will be doing is recommending a position to the full board, and it will be open for full discussion at the full board. Um, we have a motion on the floor to um, support a neutral for a neutral position on the bill at this time, and we have a motion and a second. Can I ask all in favor? No. No, oh no! Uh, uh, public oh, public comments. comment. Sorry on this bill. <coughs> Do you have any slips? I do, but it's it just says agenda item four, so I'm not. If it's not related to this bill, we can wait. Oh, that's almost starting to get up there. Oh. Okay. Yes. Uh, I'm Margaret Crosby with the American Civil Liberties Union, and this is Deborah Rottenberg from Planned Parenthood, and we are the co-sponsors, um, but we are just available to answer your questions if there are questions or concerns. Thank you. Thank you very much for your offer. All right. Um, then all in favor of a neutral position at this time and referring to the board for fuller discussion? Aye. Aye. Any nays? Okay. Okay, great. Moving on, um, the next bill is AB 635 Amiano, and this bill is sponsored by the Harm Reduction Coalition and the California Society of Addiction Medicine. This bill would amend the civil code to allow a licensed health care provider that is authorized by law to prescribe an opioid antagonist to prescribe and subsequently dispense or distribute an opioid antagonist to a person at risk of an opioid-related overdose or a family member, friend, or other person in a position to assist a person at risk of an opioid-related overdose. 
This bill would allow the licensed health care provider to issue standing orders for the administration of the opioid antagonist. This bill would specify that if the health care provider or person who possesses, distributes, or administers an opioid antagonist pursuant to a prescription or order acts with reasonable care, they shall not be subject to professional review, be found liable in a civil action, or be subject to criminal prosecution for issuing a prescription or ordering or possessing, distributing, or administering the opioid antagonist. Naloxone is used in opioid overdoses to counteract life-threatening depression of the central nervous system and respiratory system, allowing an overdosing person to breathe normally. Naloxone is a non-scheduled, inexpensive prescription med medication with the same level of regulation as ibuprofen. Naloxone only works if a person has opioids in their system and has no effect if opioids are absent. Existing law established a three-year overdose prevention pilot project in 2008. The pilot granted immunity from civil and criminal penalties to licensed health care providers in seven counties who worked with opioid overdose prevention and treatment training programs if the provider acted with reasonable care when prescribing, dispensing, or distributing naloxone. The pilot was extended in 2010 and extended liability protection of third-party administrators of naloxone. The pilot is now scheduled to sunset on January 1, 2016. According to the most recent data released by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, in 2008 there were 36,450 drug overdose deaths in the United States. According to CDC, overdose prevention programs in the United States distributing naloxone have trained over 50,000 laypersons to revive someone during an overdose, resulting in over 10,000 overdose reversals using naloxone. Of note, language in existing law for the pilot project only includes civil and criminal liability. It does not exclude health care providers from professional review. Board staff is unsure of what the reasoning behind including professional review is, but would like to continue to work with the author's office on this point and bring this bill back to the board at the April board meeting. However, this bill will help to further the board's mission of consumer protection. So staff at this time is suggesting that the committee um, recommend that the board support this bill in concept, but have staff continue to work with the author's office. Can I ask a technical question? Sure. Is that different than support if amended? Um, it is a little bit different because because I don't know, I haven't had a chance to actually meet with, I don't know what the meaning behind is professional review. Are they talking about our review? Are they talking about peer review? Um, if we actually ask for that amendment, we should have a, you know, okay. be clear on what the reasoning was behind that. So that's why we went with a support and concept. I mean, I think we could go with a support of a minute if it was sure and it's an amendment that we would want to take. Okay. I just haven't had a chance to have that meeting yet. Ms. Salmon, Dr. Salmonson. Yeah, I just, with that professional review in there, I'm not quite clear what protection the health care providers are getting. I mean, it's already not criminal to prescribe it, is it? I mean, how, what is this, well, part of what it added has, protection is this law giving if the professional review part is still in there? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure about the professional review part. Like I said, I want to look into that a little bit further. But what it, it's allowing them to give a standing order, not just to the person, but also to the family or a friend or there's, it's other than just your patient. Okay. And that's part okay. of the reasoning behind. That's what the difference because is. Because okay. the reasoning kind of behind it has been in talking, I did meet with the author's office once, but I haven't met with them again, um, is that if you're, if you're the patient and you're go undergoing a drug, you know, overdose, that you are in a position to give yourself Thank this you. drug. So and this okay. is the reasoning behind giving it to other people but would that the drug be given the name on the prescription would be to the person who was presumably at risk to overdose but yeah. then it would be administered by the yeah and, and it may be given to that distributed to that other person that administered also so the patient would give it to their family friend um, whoever's in that position and that person would be administering it to the patient hmm. so somehow this is perhaps different than what's still going on. I'm unclear on how this is different, but okay. So do you want a motion? Uh, 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 Mr. Hepley, did you have a comment? Yeah, just, just from a purely legal perspective, uh, perhaps my colleague could chime in here too, Ms. Dobbs, but I'm not familiar with the term professional review. There is some inconsistency that if it were, if we're speaking strictly of the administrative discipline system, then we would say exempt, you know, you'd be exempt from the discipline. Uh, prof professional review sort of could be somewhat vague in that is it peer review, is it some other review that we're not aware of. So uh, going forward, I would just, like I think you mentioned, Ms. Mose, we probably want to clarify if that's, mm -hmm. you're trying to insulate them from administrative action against the license or some other thing that we not be, may not be readily aware of. And peer review is a term of art, so it has a specific right. meaning. Uh, so and professional review is very different. Exactly, yeah. and I'll, I'll have this cleared up, obviously, by our next board meeting, so. Okay, so can I have... Um, a motion to support 
in concept the intent of the bill. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Public comment. I, oh, sorry, public comment on this bill. All right. Okay. All in wait, wait. All in favor? <laughs> All opposed? Good catch, Madam President. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Keep, keep nudging me. Okay. okay. Go ahead, Jennifer. The, the next Ms. bill is um, a similar topic, AB 831 Bloom, is sponsored by the Drug Policy Alliance. And this bill would require the California Health and Human Services Agency to convene a temporary working group to develop a plan to reduce the rate of fatal drug overdoses in California. This bill would allow experts and staff from the Office of Emergency Services, State Department of Alcohol and Drug Programs, State Department of Public Health, Office of AIDS, and any other staff that the Secretary of CHHS designates may participate in the working group. This bill would also allow staff from the Medical Board of California and the Board of Pharmacy to participate for the purpose of identifying promising practices to reduce accidental drug overdose among patients and other at-risk groups. This bill would require the working group to make recommendations to the chair of the Senate Committee on Health and the chair of the Assembly Committee on Health on or before January 1, 2015. This bill would sunset the working group on January 1, 2016. This bill would appropriate $500,000 from the general fund for fiscal year 2014, 15, and in later years, um, and would require the Health and Human Services Agency to make grants to local agencies from the $500,000 appropriation for specified purposes, including drug overdose prevention, recognition, and response education projects, drug overdose prevention, recognition, and response training for patients and their families, naloxone hydrochloride prescription or distribution projects, development and implementation of policies and projects to encourage people to call the 911 emergency response system when they witness potentially fatal drug overdoses, programs to educate Californians over 65 years of age about the risks associated with using opiate-based medications, the production and distribution of targeted or mass media materials on drug overdose prevention and response, education and training projects on drug overdose response and treatment for emergency services and law enforcement personnel, and parent, family, and survivor education and mutual support groups. This bill will help to protect consumers and potentially save lives in California, which will further the board's mission of consumer protection. Staff is suggesting that the committee recommend that the board take a support position on this bill. I need a motion. So moved. Um, any questions from members of the board? I was going to have a discussion, then a second. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah? You're no mm. Second. I have a second. All right. Um, discussion among uh, by board members. I think it's duplicative of what the board is trying to do with its forums and other work. And and by the way, five hundred thousand dollars for local programs for an entire state of California is kind of meaningless. Um, and so I, I I don't quite see the the sense of doing. I, I think this is a little you know knee jerk reaction to the press, but I do think we're, we're on a path of trying to focus this in a way it needs to be done, so I, I, I wouldn't want to support it. Well, I kind of was silent because I wondered why do I not have a good feeling about it, but I have to say, because you kind of want it, but it, I think you articulated the 500,000 and, and the <coughs> It seems mean-spirited to not support it, but I don't think it seems like where it's a duplication of effort in a way. So um, I'll speak in support of the bill, and what I see in there is asking, um, independent of the medical board's efforts, this is <coughs> placing within the um, California Health and Service Human Services Agency the responsibility of convening a work group to ensure that in addition to the medical board and pharmacy board and licensing board's efforts, that there actually is a broader community of people who are taking ownership of and engaging in efforts to see, you know, for example, um, you know, what the Office of Emergency Services might be able to contribute to this. So I, I don't see it necessarily as duplicative, okay. though there may be overlap. Part right, of our job is to is to ensure there's no redundancy. And I think it would allow us to participate, so maybe we could bring some of the things that we've learned to this working group. That's I what mean, it's asking for specifically. Yeah, um, so I think it would help maybe get that information out to other, you know, other agencies, because state agencies don't always 
look at what other state agencies are doing. So maybe this is a good forum for that, but I'm going to leave that to the committee. And to Ms. Shipsky's other comment, there's no guarantee that $500,000 will survive through the Appropriations Committee. True. Um, so um, th there really are two separate sets of actions. One is the convening and, and trying to um, come up with a plan, and the other is gr a grant program, and that may fall by the wayside. Um, so, Ms. So Dr. Salmonson? Well, now that you put it that way, the, another group, and I don't know, just schools. I mean, what the, um, I don't know, Department of Education, I don't know if they should be at the table, but Absolutely. Um, That's a really if good they're suggestion. not named, um, I would think involve them. <laughs> And, and this, uh, I suspect that the secretary would be open to suggestions about uh, in other interested parties. And it does kind of give an opening for the secretary to include other people anyway. that they, you know, think might be beneficial to the working group. So. Well, except the focus here on this bill is for people, for um, patients who are prescribed opiate-based medications and for their families and communities. It doesn't, it, it's, it doesn't go that broadly to talk about the whole issue of kids getting access to prescribed medication sounds as if it's similar to how do you stop people from overdosing, you know, that have a legitimate prescription. Well, I would, I would suggest that it's, it seems to me that this is an educational opportunity and that what it doesn't look like it's going to solve the problem. We don't know what's going to solve the problem, but the more um, hands we put on deck, I think the better it is. I think it's um, important also, Mr. Bloom is a new, uh, ele newly elected uh, assembly person, and I think it pays for us to uh, consider um, he's trying. We should support it. So I'll call um, uh, members of the public. Okay. Um, all in favor of a support position on AB 831, say aye. 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 I think I'm it. <laughs> All opposed? So we have one, one, pr one for and one against. Oh, okay. <coughs> okay. Okay. So the, you have a support position okay. on the bill, Ms. Simosis. All right. The next bill is um, AB 916, Eggman. And this bill is sponsored by the California Society of Plastic <laughs> Surgeons and would, would prohibit physicians from using the terms board, certified, or certification when advertising unless the terms are used in connection to a specific certifying board and that board has been approved by the American Board of Medical Specialties, is a board asso or association with equivalent requirements approved by the Medical Board of California, or is a board or association with a, an accreditation council for graduate medical education approved postgraduate training program that provides complete training in that specialty or subspecialty. Of note, this bill does not address the proposal included the board sunset report that would remove the provision in an existing law that requires the board to recognize equivalent boards or associations. Existing law prohibits physicians from advertising in public communications that they are board certified unless the member is the board advertises a member of ABMS approved by the medical board or association within the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education approved postgraduate training program. According to the author's office, there are some physicians misrepresenting themselves and their qualifications by providing misleading statements in public communications. Physicians can imply that they are board certified by using the terms board, certified, or certification in their advertising. When these terms are used, it circumvents the prohibition in existing law because they are not using the term board certified. This bill clarifies existing law to further protect the public and to ensure that patients better understand the training and qualifications of physicians from whom they are seeking care. So staff is suggesting that the committee recommend that the board take a support position on this bill, but I need a motion. Do I have a motion? I'm not going to support that. <laughs> Dr. So Salmonson? And could, could we not just do cleanup regulations, the existing law? Why? Why couldn't we maybe we'll ask legal counsel? Because since, since it's prohibited from saying you're board certified, the fact that they're game playing seems to me that the law is there. You just need to be very clear in the regulation that any combination of those two words would give the inference. But uh, Respectfully, I, I understand your point, Ms. Shipsky. I think this cries out for a little bit more stronger stance of essentially putting it in in statute. We do have some regulations that talk about false and misleading. I think this goes to the core issue, though, of what actual terms you can use because 651 is very specific. It talks about board 
space certified and as I think as Ms. Smoes points out, it's you know board couple word certified or board and in next paragraph certified. I think the statute would need to be corrected for us to uh, to implement even a regulatory solution. So to that comment, let me just ask the question: <clears throat> If the author is aware of this going on, are those people then reported to the medical board? Medical board is taking a look at it as a complaint and then is taking a look at the truth and advertising portion of the what, what's already in place and then disciplining that license or we're not doing anything? Well, okay. Not working in enforcement, but I, it's my understanding that this is, um, you can file a complaint with the medical board and I think if there's an advertising violation, I believe it's dealt with site and fine. However, Ms. Kirkman, Kirkmeyer, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't believe um, false advertising is identified in the statutory list of priorities. It's not. Mm. Yeah. Can I ask a clarifying question? Um, the, uh, Ms. Simos, the, the term, there are some subspecialty sections which have certification process. Some of them go on to be actually boards of the ABMS, some of them issue a certification in, um, for example, a surgical procedure. Mm -hmm. Would this prohibit someone from representing that they are certified in laparoscopic cholecystectomies? It would not allow them to use the term certified or certification unless it's an ABMS board or a board approved by us. So. Yes, I think so, Kurt, Mr. Hopper. I would, I would agree, although that's kind of a tough question to parse out. The way I see the bill working, you can't, you can't sort of roughly combine board certified, certified, or board unless it's one of the big three. Uh, you're actually approved or, or certified by that board, the ABMS board, a board that we have set as equivalent, or one of the ACGME board. So. I think to extent to say you're board certified in a procedure. No, no, not board certified. Okay. That you are certified um, because these training programs, they're, they're shorter than a residency. They're often a fellowship program, and they provide certification in uh, an interventional procedure. It's a certificate program as opposed to a board, a bo a board which has... Um, it's a, it, it tends to be more narrow than a, so for example, a, a general surgeon may have gotten, a, done a one-year fellowship in laparoscopic nephrectomy of the left kidney. And they have a certificate, they've had advanced training in that, so it's a certification rather than a board. I, I, I'm not sure because that's not saying that you're, it's like a member board, you're in this procedure. I, I, well, I'm asking yeah. the question yeah. because it will come up yeah, that there are physicians who have gotten training and have a certificate. I think we just need to clarify the, with the off author that a cer certificate in a procedural t uh, training from an from a advanced training program that is somewhat short of a board. Uh, I, would, I, would, I would be not too thrilled about having that in the sense that if anybody did that laparoscopic kidney thing, most likely they would already be certified by a board if of general surgery. If they were not, then I wouldn't think that, then they, it's usually, if it's the real deal, it's on top of already having. Oh, I understand, and my question is. And, and they shouldn't be giving an, an exemption. It's not an exemption. It, is this a prohibition on advertising in its broadest sense, that is putting it on their, uh, where, pe where physicians advertise? Is it a prohibition on representing to the public that they have received training and certification, whether it's hypnosis? There's no abo American Board of Medical Hypnosis. But there are physicians who've gotten advanced training in hypnosis and have certification in hypnosis. Would they be prohibited from representing that advanced training? It's a close call. I'm going to pro preliminarily, and, and again, I'm open to having a discussion, but I'm going to say no because it looks like the thrust of this, if you look on, on uh, 
439, page 439 of the executive committee, it says, he or she limits her practice but shall not include a statement that he or she is certified or eligible certification by a private or public board or parent association, unless it's one, two, or three, and that's ABMS, one we recognize, or an ACGME, proscriptorium that completes training in that specialty or subspecialty. So it's kind of going to be a fact-driven inquiry about what actually certification is, hold, is held and whether that actually goes to a specialty or a subspecialty. It sounds, again, I don't know my nephrectomy from my reflectectomy, uh, but it seems to me that's more of a procedure-based thing perhaps. Mm -hmm. Again, I don't have the knowledge to be sure, but it seems like my initial reaction was this seems to be aimed at the terms board certification. Your, your question, Dr. Levine, seems perhaps more got into certification as to a certain procedure, perhaps. That's a closer call for me. I could certainly offer up opinion by the next meeting, but I... I, I, I think, too, if you look at the sponsor of the bill, this is this, is this issue that we've been grappling with, with, with people holding themselves out as being certified to do laser, Absolutely. certified to do some kind of cosmetic procedures, when, in fact, what this bill would do is require that you couldn't use those concepts unless you were board certified. Um, and so that that seems to be where they're they're going on this. And I I guess what I, what I uh, my only concern is that the language not inadvertently criminalize um, something that is an otherwise not an objectionable um, activity. Perhaps what so legal. I would suggest that given Ms. Shipsky's uh, calling our attention to who's sponsoring this bill, and there is there's been this friction with the plastic surgeons and the other kind of surgeons that do plastic work. <clears throat> that maybe we should take, and, and because of the concerns that um, Dr. Venus shared, that maybe some kind of clarification should be a support, if, uh, with clarification or support if amended. Because we're not supposed to be writing bills for one narrow focus of medical practice. We're supposed to be writing it for the general overarching. So my concern is if, if it's going to come out later that we're going to have to have another bill to clarify those people who have special... This is... It, this is only for the plastic surgeons of the world? I don't know. Because what happens to the next doctor that... No, it, and I have to say we haven't even been really alerted, alerted by the plastic surgeon, so I'm not speaking at all in, because of plastic surgery. But really protecting, in my opinion, the value of ABMS, of American Board of Medical Specialties. That's the concept that we... It's, it's analogous to saying that we want to look at international medical schools and say, do they hold up to a standard? And, and that is the concept that we want to say, do boards hold up to a standard? Is it just a club that you can buy a membership in? Or is it a testing organization, namely the American board? It's ophthalmology. It's dermatology. It's definitely not... A uh, plastic surgery issue that may have been the area where the boundary issues are the most egregious because things can happen in surgery centers that are not, and we can talk about that later. But in the past, the gatekeeper for this kind of thing has been hospitals. And right. that's My point was just as a clarifying motion or clarifying to the motion that the object being that what you said before, that these would be specialty um, procedural um, certificates taken on top of a board certification anyway. Mm -hmm. So to ensure that that's what the meaning of this bill is, mm -hmm. I'm just recommending that there Perfect. should be some kind of clarification agree with that. from the author in order to support it. And I would appreciate then to, I, I would be willing to change, I don't know that I was the maker of the motion, so I, I can't. I'm not, we have a motion to, to support the bill, and I think we can ask Ms. Samoes to get clarification. No, I can get clarification, okay, so, okay. Okay. yeah. All right, yeah. as long as, mm -hmm. yeah. that's fine. So all in favor of supporting the bill? Oh, oh sorry, public comment on this issue. Um, all in favor of supporting the bill? Aye. Aye. Um, all opposed? Okay, and th thank you very much for putting up with that. 
Okay, the next bill, AB 1000 Wachowski, is sponsored by the California Physical Therapy Association. And this bill would allow a physical therapist to make a physical therapy diagnosis, which is defined as a systemic examination process that culminates in assigning a diagnostic label, identifying the primary dysfunction toward which physical therapy treatment will be directed, but shall not include a medical diagnosis or a diagnosis of a disease. This bill would allow a patient to directly access p physical therapy services without being referred by a physician, provided that the treatment was in, is within the scope of the physical therapist and if the following conditions are met. If the PT has reason to believe that the patient has signs or symptoms of a condition that requires treatment beyond the scope of practice of a physical therapist, the physical therapist shall refer the patient to a physician, an osteopathic physician, or to a dentist, podiatrist, or chiropractor. The physical therapist shall disclose to the patient any financial interest in treating the patient, and the physical therapist shall notify the patient's physician with the patient's written authorization that the physical therapist is treating the patient. This bill would specify that it does not expand or modify the scope of practice of a physical therapist, including the prohibition on a physical therapist to diagnose a disease. This bill would also specify that it does not require a health care service plan or insurer to provide coverage for direct access to treatment by a physical therapist. This bill changes the scope of practice of a physical therapist by allowing a physical therapist to make a physical therapy diagnosis and allowing a physical therapist to treat patients without a referral from a physician. The board has taken opposed positions in the past on bills that allowed for direct, ac pa direct patient access to physical therapy services. The board was opposed to these bills because they expanded the scope of practice for physical therapists by allowing them to see patients directly without having the patient first seen by a physician, which puts patients at risk. Patient's condition cannot be accurately determined without first being examined by a physician as physical therapists are not trained to make these comprehensive assessments and diagnosis. Um, staff is suggesting that the committee recommend that the board oppose this bill, but I need a motion. So moved. Second. And question, if I could. Mm -hmm. I need a second. Oh, second. I'll second it. Um, any comments or questions from board members? Yeah, I'm confused. Mm -hmm. uh, even though I supported the oppose, but I thought it said on one point it does not expand or modify the scope of practice. Well, to me, making a diagnosis absolutely does. That seems like an internal contradiction. Well, it makes that statement on the bill, but um, it also does allow for direct access and allow the, for the for the diagnosis. So I mean, to me, the most important thing of anything is the diagnosis. So that to me is a, uh, a, whether or not that's appropriate or not, but to say it's not a change is, I think, very inaccurate in the analysis. And, and if, if people feel that physical therapists should, in fact, diagnose, then that's a different question. But to say that this bill does not allow, it, it's, it's not a change, well, it's a, a significant change. Well, actually, that's what the bill says. So that's why the analysis includes that information. No, but, I appreciate yeah. that. But that, yeah. but that makes me skeptical if the analysis of it is not accurate. Because the, to diagnose something is, is the essence of it. I wouldn't... A, well, I, that's all. Ms. Yaroslavsky? Uh, I, I would disagree. Um, uh, from the perspective of that it's poorly written, yeah, it's poorly written. But from the perspective that they're going to diagnose something that has to do with physical therapy, they're not dis diagnosing brain cancer, they're not diagnosing melanoma, they're not diagnosing lung trouble, they're l diagnosing that if you've fallen down, you've got a sore muscle that needs to be treated. So, I mean, let's get you know, our hands around what, what it is they're talking about doing. I would venture to say it's poorly written. But I'm going to tell you something. I, I don't disagree with, with the idea that, that there should be direct access to service by a physical therapist. They are trained to do a job. They have a scope of practice that they do their job. That the issue is that the insurance company doesn't pay. That's the issue. <clears throat> that's what direct access means. That it should have a time limit. It should have. But here they put more than they had in the last thing. They, they, the last time when we, when we opposed. Here they've put that, that they are going to, um, they are going to sign or state that if there's conditions that they shouldn't be treating, that they're going to be sending them to the doctor. That, that the doctor, that they're going to notify the doctor of what they're. Um, doing. So I, I'm, I'm not so, I, I think it's poorly written, I'm going to be honest, it's, I, I've said it many times, so you got the point, it's poorly written. But I think the premise of the idea of within the scope of practice of physical therapists doing what they're supposed to do, I think that we have to understand that they're trained. 
It's very hard to get into the School of Physical Therapy. They are in major universities across the state and across the country. There are very few of them. There's 13,000 or something applications for the one at the school at USC. Um, these people are coming out. They're trained to do something. So I, I'm, I'm, I don't understand how we let them go to school. We let them pay the money. We give them a certificate, and then we say you can't do your job. So uh, I'm, and we've gone through this already, and I understand that. So I'm just... Not that I disagree with you, Dr. Salmonson, not that I disagree with you, Dr. Levine, but I think that we as a board have got to, to stand up and, and understand that if we are expecting people to do their jobs, let them do their jobs. Otherwise, you know, we shouldn't be involved. There is one thing I want to point out. The last um, bill that what you're referring to from last year, it did have a time limit. It this did. bill doesn't include a time limit. And it actually says um, the patient shall notify the PT shall notify the patient's physician, but only if the patient signs off on it. So it's not there were there were stricter requirements in the last bill actually than there are in this bill and you know the stricter requirements though and in all due deference are this one says that they will be in direct contact with the doctor if it's something they can't deal with mm -hmm. the other one said that they would have four or five uh, appointments in a month so i'm not sure four or five appointments or a month is is better or worse than being in contact with a medical professional so from my perspective it's the i would rather go with a support if amended versus a a, a non-support, but that would be my preference, and it's not my preference, so, so it's not so my I choice. Think there, for me, there are two issues. One yeah. is the again the term of art diagnose, which up and it says I in understand. quotes physical therapy diagnosis. It doesn't say blankly diagnosis. The analysis bill would allow PTs to make a quote physical therapy diagnosis quote. It, uh, it says there continually above the description of the current legislation bill would allow the, a physical therapist to make a physical therapy diagnosis. So I think we need to be clear on what the bill says and not leave out. Currently, what happens is the, the physical therapy, thera the, the physical therapist devises or designs a therapeutic regimen based on the diagnosis that the patient comes with. Now, there are mm -hmm. physical therapists who provide um, you know, who have direct access. Someone comes in and says, I've got tense muscles or I've got this or that. There's nothing that prohibits or requires them to turn the patient away. They do not currently diagnose. They, they prescribe a regimen of therapy based on the diagnosis that the patient so has, and it may have been, you know, six months ago, I saw the orthopedic surgeon, I tore my this meniscus. This is based on insurance. If your doctor gives you a, a prescription to go to a physical therapist for a treatment what the doctor has decided, your insurance company pays. If you decide to go to a physical therapist for whatever injury you think you might have, that physical therapist may treat you. It's, it, the insurance is not, you pay for your treatment. The physical therapist treats you. The, and I, I, in all due respect, I think that, that this is a question of access to care. And somebody, the issue is do we want a physical therapist who's trained to do physical therapy to be able to treat you and, be, and get reimbursement from the insurance company or not? And it doesn't say that in the thing, but that's, that's the whole thing that's holding this back, in my opinion, of course. Is, there is something in the bill around reimbursement, right? Yes, it actually. Um, says that they don't have to. Or right. Yeah. This does not actually constitute a basis for coverage. The passage of this bill would not create circumstances which would require coverage by an insurance company. Um, yeah, and again, my, my concerns are the use of the term diagnosis um, because at least in, in our, my experience, th physical therapists work with physicians to, in their specialty, which is to match a treatment plan to a diagnosis. Um, and, um, and the second is to, to ask someone to refer based on a condition that, that they aren't able to treat is fine, but what if they aren't able to recognize it? And they're not necessarily trained to recognize or diagnose conditions um, that might be contributing to the presenting symptom. And so you're relying on a physical therapist to recognize in all circumstances when they ought to be referring to a physician. Well, I, I just have to speak from personal experience. I just went through five months of physical therapy with 
a entire practice that is made of doctors of physical therapy. And my physician didn't know what was wrong. They made the diagnosis. They developed the treatment and went back to her. And, and we're seeing more of these practices come up where they are doctors of physical therapy, and they are actually, the physicians are just saying, this patient's got low back pain. Can you figure out what this is? And that's what occurred in my case. So I, I, I think that's maybe where this is going, but, um, you know, that's, that seems to be out there already. I would suggest that nobody goes into a physical therapy office because they don't expect to be treated for something. So that the patient has walked into an office where they expect that someone is going to alleviate some reason they've come in for has to be an assumption that we all have to make. Whether we um, think that there might be something more wrong or more worse with the patient and they should be seeing a doctor in the first place is really the, the question. Um, you know, um, when doctors don't know what to do, they send you to physical therapists. I, I, it, that's why they're sending you to physical, they're, they're sending you there for treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, it's either that or pills or a shot, so they're sending you for treatment. So I, I just, I think at some point that the medical board is gonna have to grapple with what it wants to see these para, whatever you wanna call them, professionals within their scope of practice doing what they've been trained to do. So um, at some point, I think that, that I don't know that that's where you want to go, but if we're not going to be at the table at all, we're not going to be able to discuss what we want as part and parcel of any kind of, uh, of any kind of bill. So it's either we're, that's where it's at, I think. Dr. Diego? Um, I was just trying to look back to see if they're, you know, following that conversation, if there's something there also that says, and y at what point they report back, right? Because that's what's missing. Is that missing? What's missing is the number of visits they can go to without being in consultation with it, the doctor. Exactly, yeah. It I says now if a PT has reason to believe the patient has signs or symptoms of a condition that requires treatment beyond the scope of practice, then the PT shall refer the patient to a physician, an osteopathic physician, or to a dentist, podiatrist, or chiropractor. So now a chiropractor is in the same position as a doctor. Are you all like that one, huh? The dentist, that's a good one. <laughs> Well, that's, that could be TMJ, the TMJ, that makes sense, that makes sense. Well, so where, who made the motion? Did I make, did, who made the motion? Dr. Salmonson moved it and so, I seconded it. So are yeah. you at all willing, are you at all open to, um, to some kind of a, an amendment or not at the table at all? Well, I think it's unfortunate. I mean, to me, the best scenarios I see are when doctors and physical therapists work together and I think going in the direction of less physician involvement in in the diagnostic part is, is sort of not the direction that I see as a positive. Um, so let me just suggest to you that as far as an ethical issue, I would agree with you doctors and physical therapists should work hand in hand, but it becomes the issue of the spouse of the medical professional providing the alternative service so that the doctor prescribing to the the spouse who's a physical therapist that, that you want this surgery, this is the physical therapist you've got to go see. That's also not, that's, that's not legal. If I'm not mistaken, that's, that's a stark, a stark, a stark violation. Stark. stark violation. But I know of situations where, it, so I'm not looking that, when you say that they have to work hand in hand, I think that also has to be. Well, a collaborative, a team. I mean, I fine. think because I kind of envision that there's certain imaging studies that and then maybe we're going to say the physical therapist should be ordering them. I know that perhaps it's wrong to limiting the ordering of imaging studies well, to I, physicians. I can tell you that my physical therapist takes a look at my MRIs and is able to take a look at the MRI the same way. That, I'm, I'm not, it's not a question of that. The issue is that you have to have the tools that you have been trained to use and use them. Again, this bill is poorly written. Yeah, I guess I was just hung up on the, the internal inconsistencies of the bill that made me uncomfortable with being, you know, to kind of tell us there is no change when there is a change mm -hmm. just is, I suppose we could say neutral um, uh, or, or, or heavy duty amendments. I think the large, to me the largest deficiency in this is that there is not a mandatory report back after a, after a specific period of time. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be left to anybody um, no matter what their profession right. is, that right. it's just, you know, if, if the patient says it okay, we'll send it back. So I would hope that we somehow so, 
So could we, um, do we have the option of just referring, e referring this to the full board discussion and deferring yes, on can. taking? Perfect. Um, why don't we do that because ultimately it is the board that has to vote on this and we can re reflect that we have some, there are differences of. Mm -hmm. Wait, 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 wait. So, I mean, I would agree with you. Referring it back to the whole board, you're going to get the same discussion you got today. <laughs> so the issue is, is that within time constraints of the legislation process, is there any opportunity to do anything between now and then, the end of the month with the board? Um, I don't know this legislator, but I'm, I'm this, this previously came from Daryl Steinberg, but his, his was much better, much more. I mean, I could definitely call the I legislative mean, office. I mean, you're, it's gonna, you're not going to get any. I mean, Dr. Levine, all due fairness, you're not going to get a better discussion at the board meeting with more people. It's so, so Ms. Shipsky's concern is the lack of time. Feedback. Mine as well. Mine yeah. is the the, the use. Any of these bills uh, with other allied professionals, that there has to be collaboration and that it has to be a system of collaboration. Otherwise, it, we're going to go far off the field with everyone doing what they want to do, and that's not the purpose, I think. The purpose is to expand access, but it has to be within the health care system. And I'm, I'm going to say that I continue to have concern with the use of the term diagnosis. Okay, um, so because I, I would go along with you. I, I'll good, take good. that. We really, I would appreciate. I would direct you, please, to go back to staff uh, to go back to this person, um, <coughs> Wykowski, I guess the name is, and suggest seriously that this needs to be improved. That this is not a way to bring a bill to out at a period. I mean, no offense. Maybe it's just it's inappropriate to expect some kind of engagement on a collaborative, positive method. And we'd like to be positive, but you, you, this is. No. So I would go along the time, the time limit, absolutely, the collaboration and lack thereof noted, as well as the term uh, physical therapy diagnosis. It's got to allow physical therapists to do the job that they've been trained to within the scope of practice as they know it. Well, what I can do if we defer it to the board is, you know, make the call or stop by the author's office and just say, this is kind of how the conversation went, and we're going to be um, voting on this at the full board and just give them a heads up and what kind of things we're looking for without actually taking a position because, mm -hmm. you know, even if we take one today, it's not a, a real position. Right, but I, I do believe play. in the Physical Therapy Act. It doesn't, it does reference physical therapy diagnosis, just like the Nurse Practice Act. There is a thing called nursing diagnosis. And so, there is. Uh, so in that could be in that sure. context that they're using it, but I think we have to be very clear what that parameter means. Okay. Just a point of parliamentary procedure, um, we sort of have a motion and a second hanging out there. So I guess if we were to withdraw that, that motion and that second, to withdraw the motion. then I think it would uh, essentially die, die of its own accord, and then we could proceed, in fact, with this deferral pending uh, additional information from the author's office. And can I ask, um, before we close this item, which we'll vote on, um, we'll have to start again with the motion, but, um, right? No. No. Okay. Defer it. And, but to ask if there's any public comment Actually, on it. Actually, you can just take away your second and it dies right. for lack of a second. Right. Right. I did. Um, I, I'm a, I've been a therapist, a massage therapist for 30 years. Can you, can you come speak to the... Tell us who you are and, and speak into the microphone. Mm. Thank you. My name is Victoria Edwards, and I'm assistant to Frank Cooney working on the medical, on the um, cancer bill 1278. That's why we're here. But I would just offer, you know, besides a dictionary, I'm not a linguistic attorney or anything, but assessment. Diagnosis is a word that the medical doctors, um, you know, seem to want own, you know. And in, in my years of being a therapist, you know, to use that word with a client was like, you know, you're going to get condemned and go, you know, somewhere down there, dark and hot. So, you know, we've had, everyone has had to be very, very careful talking to people about what you're allowed to say. And I've worked as a therapist, you know, 30, 40 years with lots of people. And I don't diagnose, I suggest, I make um, assessments. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of other words and so my um, contribution to the people who, Wykowski, who wrote this, um, phys physical therapists are wonderful people. They do great things for people, you know, and they deserve to get paid just like everyone else that, you know, they get a, a, thes a thesaurus <laughs> and they start looking up terminology that they can work with if that's the problem. Um, anyway, that's just Thank my input. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you.
could you fill out a slip just so we have your name? Sure. Thank you. All right. Okay, so the next bill is um, AB 1278 Hueso. Just a point of reference, Assemblymember Hueso is now a senator, so this bill number will be changing because they've told them that they have to go find a Senate bill now, but it's going to have the same language, so I'm just going to go over it. So um, this, I, I, am, I analyze this bill as, as it's going to be amended, so um, that's, it will be in print by the, our board meeting. So this bill is sponsored by the California Citizens for Health Freedom. This bill would allow a physician to prescribe integrative cancer treatment under specified circumstances. Current law, Health and Safety Code Section 109300, restricts cancer therapy exclusively to conventional drugs, surgery, and radiation, those that are approved by the Food and Drug Administration. This bill would define integrative cancer treatment as the use of a combination of evidence-based substance, substances or therapies for the purpose <laughs> of reducing the size of cancer, slowing the progression of cancer, or improving the quality of life of a patient with cancer. This bill would specify that a treatment meets the evidence-based medical standard if the methods of treatment are recognized by the Physician's Data Query of the National Cancer Institute or if the methods of treatment have been reported in at least three peer-reviewed articles published in complementary and alternative medicine journals to reduce the size of cancer, slow the progression of cancer, improve the quality of life of a patient with cancer, or if the methods have been published in at least three peer-reviewed scientific medical journals. This bill would prohibit a physician from recommending or prescribing integrative cancer treatment unless specified informed consent is given. The treatment, meets the, the treatment must meet the evidence-based medical standard and the physician must comply with the patient reevaluation requirements and the standards for ca of care for integrative cancer treatment. In order to comply with the informed consent requirements, the physician must have the patient sign a form that either includes the contact information for the physician who is providing the patient conventional care or that the patient has declined to be under the care of an oncologist or other physician providing conventional cancer care. The form must also include a statement that says the type of care the patient was receiving or, the, or that is being recommended is not the standard of care for treating cancer in California, that the standard of care for treating cancer in California consists of radiation, chemotherapy, and surgery, that the treatment the physician will be prescribing or recommending is not approved by the Federal Food and Drug Administration for the treatment of cancer, that the care that the patient will be receiving or is being recommended is not mutually exclusive of the patient receiving conventional cancer treatment. The form must also include specified written statements. This bill would require a physician prescribing integrative cancer treatment to comply with patient reevaluation re requirements, which require that the patient must be informed of the measurable results achieved, the physician must reevaluate the treatment when, when progress stalls or reverses, and the patient must be informed about and agree to any proposed changes in treatments. This bill would also set forth the standards of care in prescribing integrative cancer treatment that the physician must comply with. The physician must provide the patient information regarding the treatment prescribed. The physician must make a good faith effort to obtain all relevant charts, records, and laboratory results relating to the patient's conventional cancer care prior to prescribing or changing treatment. At the request of the patient, the physician must make a good faith effort to coordinate the patient's care with the physician providing conventional cancer care to the patient. And at the request of the patient, the physician must provide a synopsis of the, any treatment rendered to the physician providing conventional cancer care to the patient. This bill would specify that failure to comply, comply with the bill's provisions would constitute unprofessional contact and cause for discipline by that individual's licensing entity. According to the author, integrative cancer treatment gives consumers <laughs> options for care and helps patients cope with the common side effects of chemotherapy and radiation. The author believes this bill will provide cancer patients with more options to complement conventional therapy. Staff is suggesting that the committee recommend that the board take a neutral position on this bill. I need a motion. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion among the board members? Well, just out of curiosity, why would we not want to support that just for purposes of discussion? It I mean, we could support, I think it's for the same reasons as 154, like we're taking a cautious approach, um, but I think we, we could also support this bill as well. I mean, I think they made a lot of efforts in this bill to make sure that patients are informed about conventional cancer therapy, make them sign, you know, um, written statements, yeah. make them give them that, those statements, make them meet some kind of ev evidence-based standards, are really yeah. trying to make sure that... Um, that kind of what I don't know if you remember of Mr. Serrano Sewell said in our last board meeting about you know the quackery kind of concerns and so that's why we were kind of taking a cautious approach but I mean I think we could go support too. I mean I as you read it it mm -hmm. sounded like there were some pretty good safeguards in there I even though I'm 
conservative in a lot of ways, thinking that this seems like a pretty reasonable bill. Dr. Diego? It just didn't seem to me, though, Dr. Salmonson, that it really specified who was going to be giving the treatment. So that was my only concern, and that's why I would say, like, neutral, because... Okay. You know and what I mean? It's like... Physicians. Way. Right, yeah. but what kind of training did they get for this type of treatment versus the oncologist? So that's why I go... I think the, the issue is, in all due honesty, that in the state of California, the only method for cancer treatment is radiation and chemotherapy, end of discussion. So what this is doing is allowing doctors to suggest other forms of treatment. That's all. I don't think that they're asking for other providers to be able to do it. It's just for... Yeah, the, and, and that was my question also, because it says 109295, paragraph 109295, it says, um, any individual person firm association or other entity engaged or representing himself or herself in the diagnosis, treatment, alleviation, or cure of cancer. And uh, oh. entities and associations and firms don't diagnose, treat, or alleviate, or cure cancer. It's practitioners. Well, that's part of existing law, though, too. So they're just adding to existing law. So, um, and it's what information is given to the California Department of Public Health. That it's in the health and safety code sections. Oh, so well, there you go. It, it's just um, adding to that um, more information to be given to the department, but it's not allowing anyone other than a physician to. This is right. focused yeah. on the physician. So. This is this is about physicians. Yes, yes, right. yes. yes. It, practitioners or PAs. Phys no. Physicians, just physicians. And and I just to comment, I understand that. I understood that that it was physicians, but what it doesn't necessarily specify is what kind of a training. If it was all going to be oncologists to offer optional treatment, that's great. But is it all of a sudden going to be the plastic surgeons trying to do uh, oncology? Which is part of the reason we kind of wanted to take a cautious approach. Yeah, that's I why mean, I would support that versus support the bill. Okay, but I leave it to the board. But we never legislate what physician specialty can do what treatment. Mm -hmm. So, correct. Mr. Cooney. My name is Frank Cooney, and I'm the director of California Citizens for Health Freedom, and we are the prime organization behind this particular bill. And of course, it's strictly for physicians. What it does open up the door to is that physicians that deal with, uh, deal with health products that are in the health field to be able to be utilized, and we're talking about herbs or uh, nutritional supplements in that particular area, which is not done by the FDA at all. It doesn't deal with that area. And there's been a whole range of research in that particular area that shows deep benefits for this uh, process. There are some others, but that's primarily the main reason, is to move away from the harsh approach of chemotherapy, radiation, <coughs> surgery, to a much easier approach and a more health approach that deals with it. And the alternative physicians that deal with that try to determine first what caused the cancer and deal with the causation of the cancer. And often it's diet, sometimes it's lifestyle, sometimes it's genetic inheritance will move in that direction, but often it's toxins within the body. And the effort then is to work with natural removal of toxins in the body and build the immune system so the immune system functions better is, is the major focus on that particular process. And I might indicate I've been in contact, I've been to Arizona and to Nevada and visited the clinics there and both of them were run by physicians who fled California because of the existing law and the president of the Arizona homopathic group wants to come back to California. He's an outstanding physician and says, but I can't, I can't treat people under the existing law. We want to have that changed. And the physician who started the homopathic group up in Nevada, he's deceased now, was a physician who fled California and on that, on that process. And I suspect there are many others 
And there are physicians who would come to California and be able to practice in California if the regulations were eased up so they would be able to come and practice good medicine. We're not talking about quacks or fraud or anybody who's not a physician. We're talking about competent physicians to being in the field to be able to offer these type of services. Any questions that you'd like to ask me? Thank you. So we have a motion on the floor for a neutral position on the bill. Any other comments from members of the public? If not, can I have a vote uh, for, uh, from those all of whom would vote aye on supporting uh, on a neutral position on the bill? Aye. Aye. Okay. Okay. Any nays? I think not. I think we got. Thank you. Okay, thank you. The next bill is AB 1308 Bonilla, and this bill is sponsored by the American Congress of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and would allow a licensed midwife to directly obtain supplies, order testing, and receive reports that are necessary to the licensed, midwif licensed midwife's practice of midwifery and consistent with the scope of practice for a licensed midwife. This bill would also require the Medical Board of California to adopt regulations by July 1, 2015, defining the appropriate standard of care and level of supervision required for the practice of midwifery and identifying complications necessitating referral to a physician. This bill would require a licensed midwife to disclose in oral and written form to a prospective client the specific arrangement for the referral of complications to a physician and surgeon. Although required by law, physician supervision is essentially unavailable to licensed midwives performing home births, as California physicians are generally prohibited by their malpractice insurance companies from providing supervision of licensed midwives who perform home births. The physician supervision requirement creates numerous barriers to care in that if the licensed midwife needs to transfer a patient baby to the hospital, many hospitals will not accept a patient transfer from a licensed midwife as a primary provider who does not have a supervising physician. Licensed midwives also have difficulty securing diagnostic lab accounts, even though they are legally, legally allowed to have lab accounts. Many labs require proof of physician supervision. In addition, licensed midwives are not able to obtain the medical supplies they have been trained in or expected to use, oxygen, and medical supplies that are included in the approved licensed midwifery school curriculum. The inability for a licensed midwife to order lab tests often means the patient will not obtain the necessary tests to help the midwife monitor the patient during pregnancy. The board, through the Midwifery Advisory Council, has held many meetings regarding physician supervision of licensed midwives and has attempted to create regulations to address this issue. The concepts of collaboration, such as required consultation, referral, transfer of care, and physician liability, have been discussed among the interested parties with little success. There is disagreement over the appropriate level of physician supervision. The Midwifery Advisory Council has also held meetings regarding the lab order and medical supplies medication issues and has attempted to create regulatory language to address this issue. However, based upon discussion with interested parties, it appears that both issues need to be addressed through the legislative process. This bill would address one of the barriers of care by allowing a licensed midwife to directly obtain supplies, order testing, and receive reports necessary to the licensed midwife's practice of midwifery which would help to ensure consumer protection. This bill would also require the board to adopt regulations to address physician supervision and to identify complications necessitating referral to a physician. However, the board has been unsuccessful in endeavors to adopt regulations regarding physician supervision in the past. Board staff will continue to work with the author's office and sponsors on language that will help to solve the issue of physician supervision and remove barriers to care, while at the same time help to ensure consumer protection. Board, board staff is suggesting that the committee recommend that the board support this bill if it is amended to better clarify what the supervision requirements should be in statute versus in regulation. And I've actually talked to the sponsors today, and this is definitely a work in progress. This is just kind of to get us um, to the table. So we will be continuing to work together, but we would like to support it with some amendments. So moved. moved. Do I have a second? You have right here. All right. Um, any comments, uh, questions from members of the board? Oh, yeah, sorry. I wonder if, I mean, we could just suggest supporting their access to the supplies that they need and just bifurcate out that supervision business because I think you get to, they'll get their things right away, but I still feel demanding that we somehow implement the supervision 
arm when there are such barriers, namely the liability issue, to me are lumping two very disparate kind of things. So I would be completely supportive of them getting the oxygen, you know, go for that. And then let's separately try to solve what seems like a kind of a regulatory conundrum. Well, I don't we, know if the authors would be open to that. but we, we could take a supportive amended position and see what kind of, because basically right now they're trying to basically come up with something. So we could see kind of what they come up with. And then, of course, I'm going to bring it back to the board again. And if language is in there to address the supervision which issue, which right now it really isn't. It's just telling us it's to do something. It's demanding it again. And so, whereas I think we're support, at least I am, supportive of their getting the oxygen and getting lab tests. But at the same time, somehow saying solve this magical you know problem that's kind of a legislative issue where supervision is being mandated so well, i would recommend that what dr Thompson is suggesting it would be yeah. very nice okay. except for the fact except for the fact that this sponsor of this bill is the american congress of obstetricians and gynecologists which we've not had in the past otherwise i would agree with you that you know you might as well do it incrementally but given who is sponsoring this bill Let's assume that they've got some strength and power in the legislature. But I, I like, and I, and Ms. Whitney correctly points out the staff's recommendation of saying it needs a statute fix and not just uh, exactly. try to. Yes, exactly. Fix. So thank you. And this seems to reflect a commitment on the part of ACOG to actually solve the problem. Absolutely. Which is their problem, actually. What well, was ACOG's to problem? That. Yeah. Well, it is yeah, there. It was well, but they've been though. coming to meetings. They've been showing up. They've been participating. They've been engaged. Staff has been really very helpful, and it's it's a different mood. It's great in the room. Okay, so we have. Doesn't work. Can I ask a question, Ms. Smose, if I may? When you talk to this office, office, author's office, one of the things that we talk about supplies. Could you clarify whether it's the common understanding that supplies means dangerous drugs because those two aren't necessarily the same thing? To get to dangerous drugs, issuing a drug order, issuing a prescription, you're going to have to amend the pharmacy law. Well, it doesn't. It doesn't really specify in the bill. So it's where do you okay. see where do you see dangerous drug? Obtain supplies, order testing, and receive reports that are necessary. Was, the reason I say that is we ran some regulations one time that talked about analgesics and other things. An analgesic per se is something that's. You, you acquire via prescription. I, I, where is it listed in this? No, it's, I, I know it's not in here. I'm just saying. Oh, that, that, yeah. I'm just asking for clarification if that issue has come up. Did supply. you want it to add? I did not added? ask that question. No, I, I, I'm not. I'm just seeking clarification. Okay. I'm not. So, okay. so clarification that the word supplies does not include dangerous. the intention. Well, no, make sure of, it also doesn't include opiates. Of, oh, a prescription. Dangerous drugs Products? includes. Yeah. So. Well, not yet. They can't prescribe and they can't dispense. Right. So, okay. So just clarification that that isn't in the intent. Yes. And okay, we, we'll so is there any public comment on um, supportive amendment on this bill and our position? Mr. Mr. Cooney. I am not a midwife, <laughs> but I've attended many, many meetings over many, many years on this issue. And I salute the board when they created the advisory committee and the advisory committee has come up with recommendations and I think it's great that you're coming to grips with it. I might indicate when you're talking about supplies, it could be put in there that medications or supplies that are within their scope of practice, they are trained to use certain materials and I don't know what they are into it, but they are trained to have it and it's within their scope of practice and that might be able to answer that practice by having wording similar to that. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Okay, so all in favor of a supportive amended? Aye. Aye. Okay, any opposed? Thank you. Next bill, SB 352 Pavley. This bill is sponsored by the California Academy of Physician Assistants and would allow physician assistants, nurse practitioners, and nurse midwives to supervise medical assistants. Medical assistants are unlicensed personnel trained to perform basic administrative, clerical, and technical support services in a medical office or clinical setting. These services include, but are not limited to, taking blood pressure, charting height and weight, administering medication, performing skin tests, etc. The, board, the Bureau of Labor and Statistics in 2011 reported that there's nearly 82,000 medical assistants employed in California. 
Currently, a physician must be present in the practice site to supervise a medical assistant in most settings. Physician assistants and nurse practitioners concurrently supervise medical assistants in licensed community and free clinics. If a physician is not present, medical assistants are limited to performing administrative and clerical duties and cannot perform or assist with simple technical support services if the physician is not on the premises. According to the sponsors, physicians have been delegating the task of supervising medical assistants when the physician is not in the office for over a decade in community clinics, and the Physician Assistant Board and the Department of Consumer Affairs have not reported any patient safety issues or disciplinary action related to physician assistant supervision and medical assistants. With health care reform being implemented in 2014, this bill may help to accommodate the expected increase in patients, as well as to help ensure that medical assistants are being supervised while a physician is not physically present in the office. Given that physician assistants, nurse practitioners, and nurse midwives are currently allowed to supervise medical assistants in some settings now, and that this authority would have to be delegated by the physician, it makes sense for this to be allowed in all settings. However, existing law prohibits physicians from aiding and abetting unlicensed individuals from engaging in the practice of medicine. Board staff suggests that this bill be amended to include language to ensure that if a physician assistant, nurse practitioner, or nurse midwife were to allow the medical assistant to perform tasks that are not in the approved scope of responsibility, that the physician assistant, nurse practitioner, or nurse midwife would be held responsible, similar to physicians, and subject to discipline by their licensing board. Staff suggests that the committee that the committee recommend that the board take a neutral feminine position on this bill, but I would need a motion. So moved. Second. I'll sec. All right, we have a second. Um, Ms. Shifsky seconded. Yeah. Second. Um, any questions, comments? Yeah, well, that said, it, it, why were we not thinking of uh, support if amended? And we could. Um, we don't really overs oversee PAs or NMs, or which is why we were going well, with the NA. But we could take a support. Well, amendment. except in a sense, we indirectly do because yeah. do not PAs work under a delegation a services agreement of physicians? That's so true. I would think that you know, if we think that it's appropriate, if amended, that. It seems kind of appropriate. So, how about if I change the motion to sub, uh, to uh, support if amended, please? Second. Okay. So we have a support if amended, with the clarity on the amendment. But very much the they have to have that same thing, otherwise opposed. You know. But okay. we feel strongly. We're not neutral on this okay. one. So the amendment would be similar to what's in law for physicians. Absolutely. That would um, basically say that if a PA, NP, or NM were we found aiding and abetting unlicensed individuals Absolutely. that um, that basically we, they'd be subject to discipline. It's similar Absolutely. to what physicians are held liable if they're if they're allowing an MA to do something that's not in their scope of responsibility. Right. So currently, that's not in the bill, and that's what the amendment is. Exactly. Is all these pieces of paper for that sentence. Well, sure. <laughs> um, do we have any other board member comments or head shaking? Um, Okay, um, it, um, any members of the public want to comment on this bill? If not, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. okay. I'm happy to report I'm on my last bill. Mm. Okay. <laughs> This is one that I mean, a lot of you will be interested in. Okay, SB 809, Desonier and Steinberg, is sponsored by the Department of Justice and would establish the Cures Fund that would be funded by an annual 1.16% licensing certification and renewal fee increase for licensing of boards that are authorized to prescribe or dispense Schedule 2, 3, or 4 controlled substances. This includes the Medical Board of California. This bill would make the money in the Cures Fund available for allegation allocation to the Department of Justice upon appropriation by the legislature for the purposes of funding the CURES program. This bill would specify that the fee increase shall not exceed the reasonable costs associated with maintaining CURES. The 1.16% annual fee would result in an increase of $18 for physician renewal fees, $9 each year of the two-year renewal cycle, and a $9 initial licensing fee increase. This bill would also impose an unspecified one-time tax on health insurers for the purposes of upgrading the CURES system. And it's unspecified because it's a blank in the bill right now. This bill would impose an um, unspecified ongoing tax on manufacturers of controlled substances for the purposes of creating and maintaining a new enforcement team in DOJ 
which would focus on prescription diversion and abuse and criminal activity associated with bringing larger quantities of illegal prescription drugs into California. This was mentioned earlier in the Education Committee today. This team would co coordinate with state, federal, and local law enforcement entities and work with various healthcare boards and departments to conduct investigations based on CURE's data and intelligence. Once CURES is funded, upgraded, and able to handle inquiries from all eligible prescribers and dispensers in California, this bill would require the Department of Justice to notify all prescribers and dispensers who have submitted applications to CURES that they are capable of accommodating this workload. The Department of Justice would also be required to notify the legislature and post the notification on their website. Once the Department of Justice issues this notification, all prescribers and dispensers eligible to prescribe and dispense Schedule 2, 3, and 4 controlled substances would be required to access and consult the electronic history of controlled substances dispensed to a patient under his or her care prior to prescribing or dispensing a Schedule 2, 3, or 4 controlled substance. This bill contains an urgency clause, which means it would take effect immediately once signed into law by the governor. Board staff has a concern in relation to collection of the renewal fee. There needs to be an implementation schedule included as the board sends out renewal date notices 90 days in advance and we need to give licensees appropriate notice of their renewal fee increase. Board staff is also su suggesting that the fee increase not be an annual fee increase but a 1.6% 1 1 increase on licensing and renewals. So in fact, it would be $9 for initial licensing and $9 for renewals. This bill requires physicians to utilize cures prior to prescribing Schedule 2, 3, and 4 controlled substance, substances once DOJ has provided notice that the system is capable. However, there is no penalty associated if a physician does not comply. Requiring a physician to utilize cures each time they prescribe a Schedule 2, 3, or 4 controlled substance and also requiring the pharmacist to utilize cures before they disp dispense that same prescription may be overly excessive. In addition, placing a tax on manufacturers to support a new enforcement team in the Department of Justice may be premature as CURES will not be upgraded for some time. The board believes CURES is a very important enforcement tool and an effective aid for physicians to use to prevent doctor shopping. Although the board currently helps to fund CURES at a cost of $150,000 each year, these funds cannot be used for staffing. The board is aware of the issues Department of Justice is facing related to insufficient staffing and funding for CURES. And due to the importance of this program, staff is suggesting that the board support any effort to get cures more fully funded in order for the prescription drug monitoring program to be at optimum operating capacity. Board of staff suggests that the committee recommend that the board take a support and concept position as this bill is a work in progress with the following noted concerns. Fee increase for renewals should be biennial versus annual. An, impl an, implementation, an implementation schedule for the fee increase should be addressed. The requirement for the use of cures should include a minimum penalty if it is not used. And DOJ enforcement teams should not be funded until cures system is fully operational and upgraded. I would need a motion. So do I have a motion for I'll, support I'll in the, concept? Support in concept, I'll move the motion. I'll make, okay. Now, All right, so we have a, a support in concept motion on the floor. Ms. Yaroslavsky. I'm gonna let Ms. Shipsky. Okay. I, I, I want to formulate better my all right. Ms. Are you Shipsky. formulating? Oh, she's formulating. I can hear it. Um, a couple of things. I think we do need to support it in concept. However, I, I really don't think the physician should bear the brunt of the cost for this system. Um, I think we've talked about that previously. I mean, there's no mention in here about the, the pharmacy dispensers, and there are many more of those than there are physicians. I, I didn't go through the whole list, but I can um, go it's all, through. It's all prescribers. So it's actually all boards of, um, that have licensees that are authorized to prescribe or dispense Schedule 2, 3, or 4 controlled substances. So I can go through the list um, for clarity purposes. So that's the Medical Board of California, the Dental Board of California, Board of Pharmacy, and that includes wholesalers, non-resident wholesalers, and veterinary food animal drug retailers, the Veterinary Medical Board, the Board of Registered Nursing, the Physician Assistant Board, the Osteopathic Medical Board of California, the State Board of Optometry, and the California Board of Podiatric Medicine. Why did they do drops? However, what we're not also um, <clears throat> focusing on is the genesis of the problem, and that is the drug manufacturers. And I know that there's some t the discussion in there, but I think really, quite honestly, uh, they're profiting um, from the overprescribing of these very expensive medications that are charged, and uh, both in the Medi-Cal system, Medi-Cal pays a tremendous amount of money for, for these medications. So, uh, you know, I would hope that there be some movement that, you know, the pharmaceutical companies bear the costs uh, of this system since they've caused the problem. How the bill 
bill, sorry, how the bill is written now is they put an unspecified ongoing tax on manufacturers, but not to um, fund or upgrade the cure system. It's to um, fund DOJ's enforcement team. So they are putting some kind of um, fee on the manufacturers, but not specifically. I just personally think it's inequitable to, um, to tax the providers on the problem that is being caused by the product. Mm -hmm. um, if you didn't have the product, you wouldn't have the problem. So um, I, would, I would hope that we could somehow maybe communicate that, um, that we support the concept because we know cures is extremely important and it does need to be funded, but that perhaps the source of the funding needs to come from the pharmaceutical industry. And I'd, I'd like to add a couple of other issues to the if amended list, one of which is a percentage as opposed to a flat dollar amount puts in an automatic inflator unrelated to whether or not the costs of actually maintaining the system inflate $9 as opposed to 1.16 percent because there may be other reasons that increase the, the, the licensing fee. Um, if, if, if we end up with a, f a tax on licensees, then it ought to be a dollar amount not linked to whatever happens to licensing fee. Uh, the second issue is that, um, uh, this, and this relates to the in-concept piece, um, this is a moving target, and I think having listened to the, the hopes and dreams of Mr. Small, who is now the Maytag repairman who is single-handedly maintaining the cure system, he estimated that it would take 100 individuals to enroll the all the prescribers in California. A hundred, he would have to increase his staffing by somewhere up to 100 people if he were to ever I enroll 100 percent of eligible prescribers. Their hope is, the hope is that in the rebooting and redesign of the system there will be a way to deem prescribers who are already authenticated through, for example, a secure electronic health system so that if I am I go to enter in an electronic ordering system a Schedule II or Schedule III drug, cures will automatically populate my screen with a patient activity report, not requiring me to enroll, only requiring me to continue to be authenticated in my system, which connects, and this is the, the design, the intended design of the cure system. The level of detail in the bill about you know, DOJ issues a notice and then all everybody has to enroll. Um, I think it's too detailed for uh, given that you know we don't know the extent to which we can actually and how long it will take to achieve the desired system design, which would make life easier for the DOJ as well as for the physicians and pharmacists um, in the state of California. So. I think perhaps expressing in the legislation the intent that anyone who will be using or prescribing these drugs will either, you know, have an automatic access to the information or will be required to enroll. And again, I think, as you've said, the question of how many times on one prescription cures needs to be queried and who ought to be doing that under what circumstances may be more appropriate for content experts to figure out and whether in fact all Schedule Four drugs need to be, even though we're collecting data appropriately on Schedule Four drugs, should all prescriptions for Schedule Four drugs be, be queried? I'm not so sure that's the case, but I think that, you know, that goes beyond my clinical expertise to make that decision. So just adding to the list. Dr. Salmonson. Well, I was, I think it's kind of a corollary. I was concerned about the penalty for not using cures since it's a bit cumbersome to, you know, I mean, I have to say I've tried and I didn't have all my data at the forum, unfortunately. So then it's like I'd be afraid to prescribe anything until, you know, even a five or four, you know, whatever. I mean, so, yeah, that penalty in there until we even know how easy it is to... Sure. to participate. I think we were just making the point of you're going to put a requirement, but then there's, it's not really a requirement if there's no teeth behind it, I guess. But yeah, point well taken. So we'll kind of, if we're working on it, actually how that's going to work, then that may be So premature. let me ask you a question. 
Is it possible to suggest that the people that should be paying for this is anyone that prescribes a Schedule II, three, or four controlled substance, first of all, as well as anyone that is filling a prescription for two, three, and four medication, as well as manufacturers for two, three, and four drugs? Well, I think it includes most of those except for the manufacturers because it requires all of the boards who license um, individuals who can prescribe Schedule two, three, and or four dispense. drugs or dispense. Well, you, you I mean, if you don't prescribe those medicines, I'm not sure why, but I, I, my concern is if you're not prescribing those medicines, I assume they're medicines, correct? Substances, abuses. Um, somehow it seems to me that there seems to be more shared responsibility. So I'm glad that the, it's, it's not just the pharmacist that's prescribing or filling the prescription, it's the pharmacy that's making money off of the fact that it's being it, it prescribed. It's the insurance company <coughs> that is, it, somehow it seems to me that there's, the more people that you have in the pool, I'm not, and this amount of money is gonna reap a huge amount of resources. We're so ta we're talking five million dollars a year. Yeah, essentially. Yeah, yeah. Which is not a huge amount of. Well, expenditure. but if it if they could get their computers done right, it shouldn't even cost this kind of money. Well, and it, it is not supposed to go over what the actual cost is. So, okay. I would well, assume we'll some adjustments would need to we'll be made see. once Cures is up and going, and you're not. You know, they're not. They shouldn't be taking all that money in if they don't. I think it's got to be reevaluated also on a yearly basis. I'd like that in the law too. That the, the expense of the cost in the program should be reevaluated. Shipsky. And Jennifer, can, can you inquire with the authors about um, seeing if there's a way to get some funding under the Affordable Care Act with the funding of electronic records for meaningful use? Could there not be some way that the state of California with its physicians could take advantage of that funding? So one, it might be able to help fund the system, but two, it would might defray some of the costs for the physicians who are having to access it. If they've got a mandate, if, if this would qualify under meaningful use, you know, and I think it's what 16,000, it's not very much, but there's more money coming that perhaps there, there could be some way California could tap in to that big sum of money. I'll definitely bring it up when okay. I talk to Thanks. the author's office. Okay. Thanks. Do you have enough suggestions for <laughs> things to think about? <laughs> Mr. Hepler? I just, just have one question, Ms. Mo. So I'm directing your attention to page 4-87. I know I fully understand this is a work in progress. So I'm looking at section as proposed to be included in the bill, um, section 10, uh, line 15. Uh, for the purpose of, for the privilege of doing business in the state, a tax is hereby imposed on a one-time basis on all insurers. Could you talk to the author's office if that also extends to like workers' comp insurers, um, that sort of thing? How broad is insurance? Is that health care insurers? Life and casualty. Life and casualty, property and casualty. What? My, my presumption is just those associated with the, the health care bill, but... Thank you. Um, any um, comments from members of the public? We do have one. Long due from the California Medical Association. Thank you for coming. Good afternoon. Uh, Long due from the California Medical Association. Uh, I just have some comments to make. Uh, you know, I think our, our, our CMA's views are very similar to what's been expressed here because this bill is in the early stages. Uh, it is aimed at a very important problem, of course. Um, but we have some concerns to raise and we wanted to share it with the board. Uh, CMA, well to begin, CMA unequivocally shuns abusive over-prescribing over of Schedule 2, 3, and 4 controlled substances or the diversion of such prescription drugs. Um, you know, we also recognize that this is a problem that threatens public safety and the quality of medical care. Now, as regards to cures, CMA has been and continues to be in support of the cures program. We believe that it can be an effective tool for enforcement, uh, for law enforcement, for regulators, licensing boards, and the physician community to address the problem of abusive over-prescribing. Over now, in the current form of SB 809, recognizing that it is a moving target, but in its current form, CMA has some concerns. Uh, we have concerns that the bill may carry some unintended consequences that could impede the appropriate practice of medicine. 
Uh, depending on how Cures is set up and how it operates, it may create undue burdens for its users. And moreover, in such circumstances, I think this is something that has been talked about today, uh, the, the requirement for all eligible prescribers to enroll and to check uh, the database before prescribing any controlled substance or, um, has the potential to interfere with the practice of medicine. Uh, CMA believes that the Cures program must be adequately funded and staffed uh, we believe that tax revenue that's collected from the drug manufacturers and from health insurers, as currently provided in SB 09, is the most appropriate funding source because ultimately the Cures program inures to the benefit of the public. And finally, from the onset, CMA has been engaged in meaningful dialogue with the authors of the bill uh, with the aim of, of fixing Cures in a way that makes the program reliable, accurate, usable, uh, but without impairing the practice of medicine. And we will con continue to work with the authors to try to address the concerns that we've raised. Thank you, sir. Do I have any other members of the public who'd like to speak on this bill? Seeing none, um, all in favor of a support in concept? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Thank you so much, Ms. Samos. Um, we're halfway through our agenda. Um, so why don't we move on to agenda item five, which is review and consideration of our administrative procedure manual. Ms. Kirkmeyer will walk us through the changes. I believe Mr. Hepler is going to join me. Huh? Okay. If you would please turn to tab five, page exec 5-1, you will find the board's revised administrative procedure manual. As you may remember, at the January 31st, 2013 Executive Committee meeting, the board member administrative procedure manual was provided to the members with suggested edits. At the meeting, the members approved the recommended edits and requested further edits to the document, specifically in the section on the role of the board officers, committee, chair, and panel officers. Um, and then all of the edits have been made and are now incorporated into the manual that's actually in front of you. But also at that meeting, the members also requested that edits be made to the manual regarding written comments to the board, meetings requested with members by interested parties, and procedures for members when contacted by the media. The, the document on pages exec 5-2 to 5-19 have the amendments, amendments requested by the members at the meeting. In addition, board staff also added in a section on the process for members to follow when they are served with a lawsuit. I'd like to go through each amend ind amendment individually. So if you would please turn to exec 5-8 and 5-9. This section incorporates how to handle written comments. So if you want to look at that, I don't know if you would like me to read it, Dr. Le uh, Levine, or if you want me just to ask if there's any comments on this section or any edits. I, I think just asking okay. folks right. if there are any questions. Then um, that was basically kind of the direction we received from the committee at the last meeting. So basically we will uh, obtain the written comment prior to the meetings. We will send that out to the members. Of course, there will be a deadline we've actually put that we would have to receive, I believe, within um, th four business days prior. And then we will send that out to the members so they will have that if an individual isn't available to attend the actual meeting. Great. And this was in response to a member of the public concerned that logistics preventing attendance at a meeting in the face of that, the, the, the lack of an ability to distribute written materials um, to provide information to board members was an impediment to public input, right. and the board members agreed and, and asked that this be done. Okay. All Thank right. you. Then moving on, I'm going to turn to page exec 5-16 and 5-17. On these pages, staff added a section on meetings with public and interested parties, um, media inquiries, and service of lawsuits. If you look at the meetings with public and interested parties, you'll see that we have actually said that it's okay to have these meetings, um, that they may request it of the board member. The board member um, has the ability to meet with those parties, but we do put specifically in there that we, you know, we re really strongly suggest that you make note that you're speaking on behalf of you as an individual member. This is not the policy of the board. I mean, or this is not the position of the board. And so we just kind of put that in there. And then also that you would 
post or you would state that out at the next meeting during the communication with interested parties okay any edits on that section okay moving on the media inquiries um, this one at the last board meeting um, it was actually the the members themselves wanted to keep to the policy that the board members do not speak with the press that those in inquiries actually come into our public information officer kind of as was discussed earlier in the education committee meeting and so we kind of give direction with that again pointing out that you know it, you get into trouble when you express a personal opinion they don't always see it as a personal opinion I think it's the board's position and then just referring the individual kind of given guidance to the member that they would refer the call to the public information officer okay any questions all right then the last item there was the service of lawsuits um, this was actually something that kind of come came up just recently we've had a lot of these and so we wanted to just give guidance to the members as to what they're supposed to do on this I it's not really controversial or anything it just kind of gives direction for board members and this would be really good for new board members as they come on board to let them know you know when you get those go ahead and call the office call the executive director provide the information to her and then go ahead and send that up so it's just kind of um, giving guidance on on that and then there were just some minor minor clerical edits on page exec 5-17 cleanup then not only did <clears throat> a certain party go to my council office and serve it on the city clerk but the person hung out in front of my house uh, until I came home the person came to my house too. and served so the personal service individuals yeah, personal service. yeah. He took. He left. We kept driving, and it was on the ground. We had to go pick it up. Hmm. All right. So, uh, members, uh, I'll take uh, responsibility for uh, most of this stuff. I'll take responsibility for most of this stuff. Under the service of lawsuits, my concern with the members is rather than get into a confrontation about whether or not it's proper service or not, go ahead, go ahead and accept it, and then we'll make that fight a little bit later as to whether it was proper or not. So that's sort of the instructions given there. Uh, as Ms. Kirkmeyer suggested in the last meeting, we had some concerns over, um, you know, who could meet with who and all that sort of stuff and whether a meeting was proper or improper. So uh, that is at the top of uh, page 516 is an attempt to address that situation. The media inquiry, I think Dr. Levina, one time during the last meeting, you suggested we have a, sort of a bright line rule, um, if I recall, or guidelines. And so I think the bright line rule that we came up with was to essentially, if you get a media call, to refer to the to the PIO so with that not to just to make myself make the walk around here worthwhile to get on this side of the table I'll be more than happy to answer any questions you may have we would actually need a motion to approve this and it is the um, authority of this committee to approve this and we would make these final edits and then get out a revised and final copy of this to all of the board members so go ahead I'd move to accept these edits um, are there any questions from board members about about any of these edits? Um, and I, I really appreciate what our new PIO mm -hmm. um, said this morning, which is that despite the best intentions, a as you described, you may get accosted in this grocery store by a member of the press. And I think we need, we all, I mean, common sense applies and we need to be courteous and gracious and be clear about what we can and cannot say um, on behalf of the board, any of us. Um, so, and, and, and I, think, I think your approach and trying to anticipate what we might be assaulted about <laughs> is very helpful, so thank you. Any members of the public want to comment on any of these changes to the administrative procedure manual? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? And I would also say that um, ha handing this to a new board member is not an orientation. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so there are pieces of this that really need to be called out. And um, it, my my boss um, believes that you don't uh, you don't retain something until you've heard it the seventeenth time. So don't worry not about. 16, not even <laughs> That's what he says. He's pretty smart. So, um, so that we shouldn't worry about repetition. Um, I think being a new board member, my own, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty cognizant of how intimidating an experience that was, and um, 
we need to make it make it easier for folks to understand the world we operate in. So thank you both for doing this. And maybe this. this is something at, when we do the annual um, review of the committees, because I think we have that in the strategic plan, maybe it's just something we want to bring forward at that time to go mm -hmm. over with everybody, just to point out the ones maybe we've had trouble with in the last year. So that's an option too. And the, um, in particular, pages 518 and 519 um, an annual reminder of board member training requirements and board member responsibilities just by handing it out and we'll all read it. Okay, great. So, um, we're, and update on the strategic plan, Ms. Kirkmeyer. All right, if you would turn to tab six, um, you'll find on pages exec 6-2 to 6-50 an updated strategic plan. Um, as requested at the January 31st, 2013 Executive Committee meeting, each objective has been color coded to indicate the status of each activity within each objective. Blue indicates the activity is completed or ongoing. Green indicates the activity is being completed as schedule. Yellow indicates that the activity is not overdue yet, but it is nearing its completion date. And red indicates that the activity is overdue. In addition to the color coding, each objective has been updated to indicate the status or completion of the activity. All activities are now included into this new document. I know before we weren't including them unless the due date was forward, but now with this new method, we've included everything in here. Um, the Chiefs of Licensing, Enforcement, and Legislation will continue to indicate during their committee meetings or during their program strategic plan or where up during their, excuse me, or during their updates where the items they are discussing tie to the objectives of the strategic plan so the members know the items are being completed. Several of the objectives will be dependent upon the issues that have been presented in the Sunset Review Report and whether legislation is drafted based on the issues brought to the Senate Business and Professions Committee. Staff will be monitoring the Sunset Review process in comparison to the Board's strategic plan and will see what items need to move forward after the Sunset Review, um, it, the bill goes through. Two activities in Objective 1.1 and 1.4 have dates that have changed due to the Federation of State Medical Board's maintenance of licensure project. The board cannot move forward until their pilot programs gather more information. And I'm pointing those out because usually I don't change the dates if we're past the dates. But in these two circumstances, I didn't really feel that it was appropriate for us to get hit for something that actually was completely out of our control. So we actually moved the dates in. It won't match what's in our actual strategic plan online. Again, with the sunset review process, the breeze project, and other pressing issues, some of the objectives have a red indicator. However, with the completion of the sunset review and the hiring of a new public information officer, it is believed that these items will be back on target or completed within the next couple months. The members also asked for more of a project line chart for each objective. This type of chart will be worked on and provided at the July board meeting. That was similar to a Gantt chart is what you were looking at, I, I believe. Um, it is our hope that the document with the color coding provides at least an easier view of the status of the strategic plan. So do any of the members have any specific questions on any of the objectives? Okay, if not, we will continue to update, provide an update at each executive committee on the progress with the color coding um, of each of the objectives so the board knows how it's meeting its goals and objectives. And That's it. Thank you. And finally, the final uh, agenda item is update on the sunset review hearing. Okay. And, and Dr. Levine, you can feel free yeah, to so pitch I'm, in wherever to. I'm going to start this off by saying the good news is that I can honestly report that the legislature has a great deal of interest in the Medical Board of California um, and, <laughs> and okay. was evidenced by um, a full hearing, a, a hearing room full of members of the public as well as staff and, um, well, we have pretty much the members of the committee were on the dais. I, you know, I, their questions were thoughtful and probing and not easy. Um, and I, you know, we are in the process, the staff is in the process of preparing responses to the full, we, we were, um, in the, uh, in the time allotted, we were, we, we were asked to speak to a subset of the issues that the members of the, of the committees of jurisdiction called out. And, and that took up almost an hour and a half of testimony. 
it is only a subset of those questions. And staff is in the process of finishing up a, a full and complete response to all the issues raised. Um, and w I believe that report is due next week. We have another week for submission of that. Board staff is completing that, and I'll have a chance to review it in the next couple days. And then we will submit full and complete responses to the um, to the committees of jurisdiction, both the Assembly and Senate BNP committees. I, I wonder if it would be of interest to the members of the board to see the level of, the level of questions and the answers thereof okay. that have been. Uh, I think it, I think it might be um, an exercise in uh, of. I've made, I, I would absolutely. be interested. Yeah, absolutely. We have the you've you've seen the questions. Um, I sent that out pr prior to the hearing. It was the right. thirty nine issues. Right. And and just to let everybody know, twenty of those issues were ours. So I know everybody gets uh, kind of concerned about the number that we had thirty nine issues, but twenty of those were ones that we had actually brought up in our sunset review report. So I did want to point that out. Um, but we will be we've. Um, prepared all of the responses. Dr. Levine will be reviewing those um, as the board president to finalize those. As soon as those are done, we will send those out to all of the members when we simultaneously provided that to the Senate BNB committee. So the questions and the answers and the ones that we specifically wanted to address should be noted as such. I yes. just think from an educational, the 17 times you hear things repeated, then you remember, I'm waiting for that 17th time. I can agree with you more because almost all of them in there are things that we've talked about at the board level. So, um, mine's 117. I'm and, sure Renee will agree. <laughs> and then, as Ms. Samo stated, our sunset bill has been introduced, and we await the language we have provided to the committee on March 5th of 2013 on all of our issues. So um, that will be coming out with the next amendment on the sunset bill. And my understanding is the bill itself currently only contains the date. Exactly. Just to continue us. Okay, any specific questions for Ms. Samos? Uh, uh, Ms. Kirkmeyer. Great, thank you so much. Um, so for members of the executive committee, just, just to um, um, give you advance notice that um, I am I'm planning to schedule an executive committee meeting the morning of Thursday, April 24th. Um, it will be essentially a closed meeting for the members of the committee to begin the e 25th, sorry, you're right, Thursday the 25th, um, prior to the on beginning of the panel meetings um, to begin the process of the ED evaluation. Ms. Shipsky and I will be a committee of two to re looking, and we will, prior to that meeting, we will review the form we used last year, the form that's been sent out by DCA this year, and to see which, if any, or whether we want to make any modifications. We will distribute that to executive committee members prior to our meeting on the 25th and ask you to um, take a look at it and, and fill it out. We'll have a discussion on the 25th, and then we will, um, between the 25th and the July meeting, um, we will um, ask Ms. Whitney to um, um, come up with some goals for 2000 for the next year, um, and then we will meet again on the in uh, prior in executive committee at our July meeting, finalize the evaluation um, and meet and, and complete the process. So just as a question um, as to logistics um, to do it Thursday morning versus Wednesday evening, are we going to have time for the board meeting? Is that going to afford yeah, you? Apparently, it, yes. So panel A begins, to, we're going to meet at 8, panel A begins at 9.30, and panel B begins at 11, 10.30. So we will have time. How did you work that one, Ms. Dobbs? <laughs> they always have that. They don't <laughs> seem to have any issues, panel B. We get along. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so so the, the answer, we looked at both of those and felt that we just it, have more it would be easier for folks to not be held to coming down, have to travel on the afternoon of the the Wednesday to get there for an early evening meeting. So we're okay. going to do it. If, you th if, if, if our executive director says we're going to have enough time, I'll take her word for it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I, I, know, I know you guys were just trying to schedule a 7 o'clock meeting. I and, and I want to assure the members of the committee that legal counsel has briefed Ms. Shipsky and myself on what we can and can't do in closed session. So we will, um, we will adhere to the strict definition of um, what well, and the letter, yes. 
All right. Do I, um, are there any um, agenda items that folks want to raise for the next committee meeting? If not, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Meeting adjourned.